yapmışlar. Maş fadıra tursa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Allahümme salli ve sellim ve zidu ve barik ala seyyidina Muhammed. Aşraf halkillahi ecma'in. İnşallah reyle mübareke. Müstedafet, müstezi doktor. Nabil el-Kesebani. Yurki lana muhadarata ve al-Badi'a inşallah. Ve ma'a el-Moderator al-Nahardı müstezi doktor Yasir Tuk. Bastazinu fi diqa wahda. Lan di mesajı bitati. Ili haddimha li doktor Nabil. وأن المفروض كنت أنا أستقبله بورود العالم كلها لكن هنقول كلمتين يغنوا عن الورود يعني إن شاء الله فالطالما مش فيس تو فيس مش هقدر أقدم ورد فأقول كلمة صغيرة قوي لا أقول إلا يا من ذهب ليتعلم منهم فعلمهم وعلم عليهم يا شجرتنا الباسقة يا نخلتنا المثمرة يا من يشبه شجر الزيتون والرمان ضاربا جزوره يأتي بثماره في كل زمان ومكان يا نبيلا ما تأخر ولا تردد وأتى بمحاضرته لكي يرمي ويسدد أنتظر منك الكثير والكثير نبيلا وعطاء تبقى أيها النبيل وطابت أيامك وطاب عمرك شكرا جزيلا يا خبر أبيض بنك يا مفتوح so my introduction is nothing now I know هذاك تستحق أكثر من كده الحياة والله ربنا يكرمك يا دكتور صفاء والله ده يعني أنا والله يعني مش عارف أقول لحضرتك إيه والله بجد أنا فعلا يعني مش عارف أقول لحضرتك إيه ربنا يخليك ربنا يكرمك يا دكتور صفاء والله ثانك يو فيري ماتش جدا دكتور ياسر اتفضل سيدي سيمبل وورد أباوت ماي أور برزنتيشن أور برزنتر توداي أند فور تو ستارت إز أ فيري بيج ثانكس فور إمنوفيا أند سيزيا كلاب ميتينج فور إنفايتينج مي تو بي أ مودريتور فور ذيس سيشن And special thank for um, Dr. Asafa, uh, the house power of this activity. Uh, I'm proud today to present um, one of the well-known stars in the sky of anesthesia and regional anesthesia. Uh, also a great presenter, uh, will present a very great uh, uh, presentation which I update in lower limb block, which is mandatory now for everyone to know. Regional anesthesia is not a privilege now, it's a uh, uh, basic thing to know. Uh, our speaker today is associate professor in the Department of Anesthesia at the Lehman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. He's a director of regional anesthesia section. He's also director of anesthesia service at ambulatory surgery at Ben, ben uh, Medicine at University. Uh, he's originally graduated from uh, Alexandria, Alexandria University and uh, then appointed again in uh, as a faculty of the Department of Anesthesia in Menufia University, and he returned back to Menufia now today, Egypt. His, his com he completes his residency training in Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, and the regional anesthesia subspeciality as, uh, at University uh, of uh, Florida. So uh, uh, outside the medicine, have, sorry. Hello? Are you here? Uh, outside uh, anesthesia, he has a master degree of biostatistics and MBA from a school of business. Um, his broad spectrum, um, uh, big, big scientist. He's also he have also a special interest in to improve the outcome after major or subic surgery. He's a member bo uh, of board of director of ASRA, American Society of Region Anesthesia. Also, he's a share educational trait. Tract Subcommittee of Regional Anesthesia and Acute Bee Medicine uh, at American Society of Anesthesia. Really, it is more and more and more. So because of time is squeezing, so uh, our speaker today, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Nabil Kasabani, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yasser. Thank you, Dr. Zafar. Wallahi, I'm not sure what you're saying, but I'm not sure what و يعني ذا ذا بوينت الدكتوره صفاء يعني عملتها از سكند مان والانترودكشن بتاع الدكتور ياسر از فيري كايند والله يعني يو جاست ميد ماي داي توداي بجد انا اند ذيس از نوت ان اكزاجريشن بس ويزاوت فرذر دو جاست ليتس فوكس اون وات وير هير توداي فور سو توداي ذات وير هير تو توك اباوت ابديتس اون اور انديرستاندينج اند ابليكيشن اوف ذا لور اكستريميتي نيرف بلوكس Before I do that, like, you know, I hope that, um, I don't know who's in the audience, but uh, my understanding that it's a mix of residents, junior faculty, 
and even some of the faculty, because some of my colleagues, Dr. Hussein and I see Dr. Abdul Azim and Dr. Yasser. Um, so there is like, you know, some also of the all star lineup. But just before we do that, I just, I hope this is message is really for our residents and for junior faculty. And this is not essentially a self inflation or I'm not here to talk about myself, but really I'm just telling you like, you know, where did I come from? Because it's always to me, whenever you put something and you see something in front of you, this is not like you know, an impossible journey or anything of that nature. But if you see something, you can be it, all right? So I graduated, as Dr. Yasser said, like, you know, from Kulit al and this was me, but uh, probably that was uh, 50 pounds lighter and 20 years ago, right? Well, actually more than 20 years ago, when I was discussing my master thesis, uh, I finished Alhamdulillah, I was appointed in the Fibunofiya, وكذا الدكتور صفاء كانت واحدة من الأسد اللي أنا بتشرف إن أنا اشتغلت معاها و... وبعد كده I started the journey من uh, مصر كويس uh, رحت أول حاجة على جونز هابكنز كويس I did some research there Cleveland Clinic University of Florida where I did my fellowship and now I'm in Philadelphia so the message is if you want something if you have a dream okay pursue it Okay, just your perseverance and your persistence is what is going to armor you. I can tell you, you are second to none of anyone who graduates from any other residency. Your perseverance, your science, and your hard work is going to get you where you want to be. And this is a message that really, like, you know, I want to get out of today's lecture. Today, I'm talking to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia is a very nice city, has a lot of culture has a lot of resemblance, at least in my mind, to Alexandria. You may have remembered the movie Rocky and the, the, with the four parts, and when he was jumping up and down on the stairs, this is exactly where it took place, in the steps of the Art Museum, and there is a statue of Rocky like in front of that, and it has a lot of like cultural reference, and uh, if you're here, like I would love it like if you stop by to visit. I work at Pimper Presbyterian Medical Center, and this center is mainly a center for orthopedic surgery. We do, uh, in the Orthopedic Institute, we do everything between elective and uh, emergency orthopedic surgery. This is the skyline of the city of Philadelphia, but this is from the helipad, where the helicopter lands for the trauma. And it's usually very dangerous to take, like, you know, this picture with the skyline. So when you go up there, usually the security guards chases you out of there. But so, but just I was able to sneak that picture in. Anyway. So I have no financial disclosure, except that I'm a member of the Azure Board of Directors. This is my emails, and I also put my Twitter handle. If anybody has any questions after the lecture, I would be happy to catch up. So what we're trying to do today, we're trying to review the anatomy of both the lumbar and the sacral plexus, and we're gonna give you an overview of the classical and contemporary approaches for blocks of the lower extremity. We're gonna talk about indication and complication of each block, and also, so we're going to talk about the current and future trends in peripheral nerve blocks for the lower extremity. So we're going to take it back to the basics. So what are the basics? So the basics, we know that from the nerve supply, that the nerve supply of the lower extremity comes mainly from the lumbar and the sacral plexus. And the lumbar plexus, we know it comes from, it originates from L1 to L4, and the sacral plexus is from L4 to S3. And we know the major branches of the lumbar plexus are gonna be the femoral nerve, the obturator, and the lateral femoral cutaneous, in addition to some other, um, some other uh, nerves. And we also, we know that the major product of the sciatic, uh, uh, of the sacral plexus is gonna be the sciatic nerve. So with that said, um, the, let's just focus first on the branches of the lumbar plexus. So you see, this is a laundry list of the different branches. And here, just we are going to just like you know, play a video clip to just show you some of the anatomy. And the main reason, because I believe really the anatomy is key to everything. So to just orient you, this is going to be the head right here, and this is the feet. So head up here, feet up here. The first branch of the lumbar plexus is going to be the subcostal nerve, which is the nerve the 12 thoracic and the first lumbar, they're gonna do the subcostal nerve. The nerve to follow is gonna be the iliohypogastric and the ilioinguinal nerve. 
And after that, this big muscle that you see in the middle right here, this is gonna be the psoas major. And you're gonna see a nerve that's coming from the lateral border of the psoas major. And this is gonna be the lateral femoral cutaneous that we're pointing at right here. And we are gonna track the lateral femoral cutaneous down under the inguinal ligament as it goes down to the lower extremity. So you see it's just gonna dive under and it's gonna emerge and it's gonna be between the sartorius muscle right here and the tensor fascia knot. And again, regional anesthesia is almost 99% anatomy and the rest is just skill set. So that's why it was very important for me to put that up there. The genital femoral nerve is also like, you know, uh, an additional nerve of the lumbar plexus. However, it will not have a, a lot of clinical utility in our regional anesthesia practice. Uh, the bottom line, you see the psoas major muscle. Um, medial to the psoas major is going to be that nerve. This is the obturator nerve, all right? And the obturator nerve, you see, it's coming from the medial side, and it's going to divide into anterior branch and posterior branch. And the anterior branch and the posterior branch is going to sandwich the adductor brevis muscle. It's one of the adductors of the hip. So you're going to see here on the medial side of the thigh, you're going to see the two branches of the obturator nerve, right? And really, they're going to sandwich the adductor brevis muscle. So we're going to go back up again to the pelvis, and you're going to see the psoas major, right? And lateral to it of the lateral femoral cutaneous, medial is the obturator, and from the substance of the psoas major, there comes like you know, the major branch, which is a femoral nerve. And you see that it comes like you know, from underneath the, the inguinal ligament, it's almost a flat nerve, and it has a lot of branches. All these branches, they are the muscular branches that's gonna supply the foreheads of the quadriceps. And you're gonna see it's gonna be lateral to the femoral artery right there, right? And it's almost lying flat anterior to the iliopsoas muscle. This anatomical structure is key. And if you did not get out of today's lectures, like you know, with some of the anatomy, I think like you know, we are missing the point here. So now we have established the basis of this. We also have to be very familiar with the dermatomal supply and with the, uh, with the supply of the nerve, which nerve supply, like you know, which muscle, which tendon, and which part of the bone, because based on the surgery and based on the planned surgery, we know the nerve supply of this area that's going to have the surgical insult, and we can target our block on regional anesthesia to really benefit like you know, that patient to the most we can. So we're going to start from blocking of the lumbar plexus. So we said the lumbar plexus come from L1 to L4. And it lends itself to a lot of techniques, including the nerve stimulation, the ultrasound. And when you look at the ultrasound anatomy, the ultrasound anatomy is very interesting. So if you see this patient uh, is going to be on the uh, lateral decubitus, and the scan of the ultrasound is going to be something like this. And if we're going to take this slice from the ultrasound and look at it on that side here, you're going to see the vertebral body, the transverse process. And the muscle in front or anterior is going to be the psoas major that we just looked at. And posterior to the transverse process is going to be the rectospinae muscle. And from the very tip of the transverse process is going to have the quadratus lumborum. And you're going to see this almost like you know, the tri leaves um, shape of the quadratus lumborum, the psoas muscle, and the rectospinae. And in the middle, you're going to see the transverse process. This anatomical relation is also going to be key in our planning of the different nerve blocks because the lumbar plexus is going to be somewhere in here. So we can do that under ultrasound guidance if the body habitus allow. And if not, we can use the assistance of a nerve stimulation. So as a technique, it really lends itself to a lot of um, a lot of the uh, of uh, techniques. So what's the indication? Okay, it's indicated for hip surgery, knee surgery, and as we mentioned, it is very versatile, like no block. Uh, complication? Well, it's, it's a deep block, and there's a lot of vital structures around it, and we always teach our residents that complication of any block, because the tip of the needle is somewhere it's not supposed to be. What does that mean? 
So if the tip of the needle landed in a blood vessel, it's going to give you bleeding and hematoma. If it landed in a kidney, it's going to give you a kidney injury. And in terms of difficulty, maybe if this is the first time that you're picking up a needle and doing a nerve block, and this is your first year, maybe just this is a block like you know, for somebody who is much more familiar, much more facile with the regional anesthesia, just because of the technical difficulty of uh, that technique. And right now we, uh, we have alternatives to the lumbar plexus. So it's not like you know, that we're completely going away from that block, but we really have alternatives. So what are some of the alternatives that we have? We're gonna go back to the anatomy again. So this is all about the anatomy. So you see the iliacus muscle here, you see the psoas muscle, and you see the three nerves, one, two, and three. So this is essentially the femoral, the lateral femoral cutaneous, and the obturator. On top of the iliacus and the psoas muscle, which we can collectively call the iliopsoas muscle, right here, okay, and this is the three nerves that we have designated, there is gonna be a fascial membrane. And this fascial membrane is gonna extend from the thigh and is gonna go all the way up. So this fascia membrane is called the fascia iliaca, all right? So if I'm able to put my local anesthetic underneath the fascia iliaca, whether this was from inferior or superior to the inguinal ligament, the idea is the local anesthetic is gonna spread and hopefully it's gonna cover the major three branches of the lumbar plexus, which is the femoral, the lateral femoral cutaneous, and the arterial. I hope that we're all following and everybody's good that far. So how do we go about that? We can do ultrasound. So if you put your ultrasound, you're gonna put your ultrasound right here, and this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get the femoral nerve, you're gonna get the iliopsoas muscle that you're looking at, and this is the sartorius, and that hyperechoic line that see the tips of the white arrows, this is gonna be the fascia iliaca. So if I'm able to put like, you know, my local anesthetic under the fascia iliaca, which is right here that uh, highlights in blue, the hope that this local anesthetic is gonna spread up and down and cover the major branches of the lumbar plexus. What is the utility of that? Okay, just the major example is hip fracture. So, uh, grandma come in and she is 80 or 90 years old. She fell and she has hip fracture. So before you know it, in the emergency department, they start to, she's in pain. So they're gonna give her two milligrams of morphine, four milligrams of morphine. And then all of a sudden, she's gonna start to be delirious and she's gonna start almost a spiraling down. Uh, usually the outcomes is not like no, very good. Contrast that with a, a different scenario. Grandma comes, she has that, she's complaining of pain. You're on call, they call you down, you go down, you do a fascia iliaca block. Grandma is much more comfortable until she had the surgery and she did not receive any opioids. So it's great. We have a lot of evidence to support that. But unfortunately, when we looked at something called the Optum database, and this essentially is a pharmacy database, but has a capturing a registry of all the procedures that is done, we found that only Okay, 3% of patients with hip fracture get like you know, the fascia iliaca block in this country, in the United States. So although that we have evidence to support it, and it's relatively easy to do in different settings. Um, so what we try to do, we try to work with our physicians and we try to work also with uh, emergency department physician. So what did we do? As you see here in the back of the ultrasound, we have laminated cards, and this laminated card is essentially describing how to do the fascia iliaca block. And we put kits, and this kit has the local anesthetic, it has what type of needle, and essentially everything that you will need to just grab and do that nerve block. And all what they have to do, even if they're not like, very familiar with the nerve block, is to look at this laminated cards. And we even generated like some QR codes for them that you see here in the bottom of the screen, right? To just uh, have to do this fascia in the ankle block. So I'm just gonna go through that real quick. And these two QR codes, by the way, this are for two things. This is for the landmark approach and also for the ultrasound approach. Let's say that the person who's on call is not very facile with the ultrasound and they just want to use it by landmarks. We have another video that's very similar to that one. That's also when this can is gonna take them for how to do the fascia iliaca. So right now we did our landmarks. This is the ASIS and the pubic tubercle. 
and we divided that line into three segments and we are feeling for the femoral artery. And as we're feeling for the femoral artery, we're gonna just, uh, just draw the line of the, where we feel the pulse. And just lateral to that, if you're doing that with just the landmark approach, you're just gonna go through the skin and you're gonna feel the two fascia clicks or the two pops, as we say, pop, pop. And this is a needle going through the fascia lata and the fascia iliac. But however, the, I think we can do better. What we can do, we can put our ultrasound probe when we put our ultrasound probe, right, we are gonna first like no look for the femoral nerve, right, as you're gonna see here in a minute. All right, and we're gonna numb up the skin. And then we're gonna uh, look for the femoral nerve. So you see the femoral artery, you see the femoral nerve. We're gonna scan lateral. And as we scan lateral, you're gonna see the sartorius start to show up. And under the sartorius right here, this is gonna be the fascia iliaca. And you see the needle is approaching, right? And it's gonna go through the fascia iliaca. And once the needle is there, we're gonna start to inject and we're gonna see the pattern of spread. And the pattern of spread is very important because you wanna inject in the right, in the correct fascial plane you would see here that what we call the unzippering, how that whole plane starts to distend. It's not really just a very localized spread, but that spread like starts to spread in that plane and the, it goes up and down. And as it goes up and down, it covers the nerves, the target nerves. Well, okay, so some people argue that the doing that probably is not very good for the hip because it can be low. So what can we do? We can, maybe we can just go a little step higher and just, approach, the same approach, but from above the inguinal ligaments. So how is this going to look like? So you're going to see the sartorius right here, you're going to see the inguinal ligament, and you're going to see the abdominal wall. So remember, like, you know, this structure, inguinal ligament, sartorius, and the abdominal wall, the muscles of the abdominal wall. So let's see, like, you know, how this is going to look like under the ultrasound. If this is the ultrasound probe that I put across the inguinal ligament, it's going to look something like that. You're going to have that constriction. You're going to have the sartorius. This is towards the feet and this is towards the head. This is going to be the antenna oblique. This is what they call the bow tie. The bow tie is like the pubiona. The, the, the middle part of the bow tie is the inguinal ligament. And you have the sartorius on one side and you have the antenna oblique. And you really come from below just going through. And you're going to be pushing the same muscle, the iliopsoas muscle. But now you're almost in the pelvis. And that will help spread of the local anesthetic even more superior. So this is a proposition. It's going to be next to the ASIS, and it's going to be that way. And we're going to see the injection, all right. And as you see, the needle is coming from uh, codet going cephalad, and this is going to be the correct spread, the pattern of spread. As you see, the local anesthetic. This is a local anesthetic going superior. So that's why that the popularity of something the lumbar plexus is kind of just. Um, it's not as popular as it used to be maybe 10 years ago, but still like, you no, know, it has like a lot of clinical utility. All right. But you have to know that when you do these nerves, you're still getting like, you know, the femoral and there's still the risk of um, falls as we are going to see in the next few uh, section. Now we can also debate when we do that, our hope is we get coverage for the femoral, the arterial, and the lateral femoral cutaneous. Is the arterial covered all the time? You know, it depends who you ask, but the at least we learn from the anatomy, there is a fascial planes that are gonna separate the obturator in some patients, and maybe that you're not gonna get it no matter how high your local anesthetic is gonna go. And also there was a distinction between the percentage of coverage, whether you use landmark approach or whether you use ultrasound in terms of the accuracy of placement of the local anesthetic. Well, okay, so we're still talking about the hip, remember? So we talked about the lumbar plexus, and now we essentially decrease the complexity of that, and we're talking about the fascia iliaca. Let's even take that one notch down, because if we're saying now that we're targeting nerves, big nerves, and these nerves can result in falls because the almost the taxes, the right behind it, and that you have to pay for doing this technique, is that you're gonna put the patient at risk of fall so how can I target really the sensory nerves that's gonna supply the capsule of the hip? So 
I would say maybe five years ago or maybe a little more, um, a group from Canada, okay, described like a block, how they can block the pericapsular nerve groups, especially for the anterior capsule of the hip. So they can block the, um, the nerve of the femoral nerve, the, the uh, obturator nerve, and the accessory obturator nerve as they supply the anterior capsule of the hip. So how is it going to look like? Again, under ultrasound, you see here, this is the anterior inferior iliac spine. So now we have slide our ultrasound probe down and we see the pubic ramus and we see the pubic eminence and we see the femoral artery right here. And this white bright uh, shadow, this is the tendon of the psoas muscle. Okay, so it's gonna look something like this. We're coming from lateral, all right? And this is the pubic ramus. And we're gonna touch the bone and we're gonna inject and you're gonna see the separation. We're almost lifting like, you know, that psoas tendon, like, you know, from, uh, from that bone. And this is essentially, we're targeting the capsule of the hip. So there has been like some studies looking at the PING block, which is the, an acronym for a pericapsular nerve group block. And the testing is analgesia for hip surgery, whether it's a hip fracture or hip arthroplasty. And there was also some investigation looking at doing the pink block in conjunction with something like the lateral femoral cutaneous to cover the incision site of the hip. And still the evidence is out there, but it's definitely something that is getting more and more popular and it has utility in our practice. So I thought like, you know, it's gonna be worth like, you know, putting that out here. Okay, so let's recap. We started with the lumbar plexus. We went down to the fascia iliaca and we did the pink block. We're still going down. Remember, we're still with the branches of the lumbar plexus. So as you go down, remember from the anatomy from the first slide when we talked about the femoral nerve. So the femoral nerve goes where? Now, this is almost a one, two, three anatomy. This, this information that we learned in the anatomy class in first and second year medical school or the femoral triangle, what are the boundaries of the femoral triangle? You have the sartorius, you have the ductal lumbus, and you have the inguinal ligament. And the femoral nerve is going to be running uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the femoral sheath. It's going to be lateral to the femoral artery. Okay, so now why is this important? Because we will see now that actually there is going to be a big deal. Where do we block or where do we target the femoral nerve? So let's see, let's see first, how can we block the femoral nerve? And again, the branches of the femoral nerve is gonna supply the hip and the knee joint, the entire anterior thigh, and its location is almost like you no know, one uh, centimeter lateral. This is how you do it, like you no know, with landmarks. If you are still a fan of the nerve stimulator, you're gonna do something like this, right? So you're gonna put the needle just lateral to the pulsation of the femoral artery and you're gonna get the twitches of the quadriceps muscle, and you're gonna decrease the amplitude of the nerve stimulation, and once you go down below 0.5, you know that the tip of your needle is close to the nerve, though this can be debated, and we inject our local anesthetic. But again, I think we can do better than that, because we have the ultrasound, and you see the femoral nerve right here, the fascia iliaca, the iliopsoas, and as we see it, we see the anatomical structure, and we can do it with that. By the way, like you know, most of these clips and the videos, like you know, some of them are mine and some of them are like you know, from various YouTube from different authors, all right? So these are not like you know, entirely like my videos and they are published in the public domain. This is my disclosure. They are all available like you know, on YouTube. Um, so you have the femoral artery, okay? You have the fascia iliaca and you have the femoral nerve right here and the iliopsoas. So what you're gonna see that we're gonna advance the needle from lateral to medial, we're gonna go through the fascia iliaca and we are gonna to start to inject the local anesthetic and the idea almost to dissect the nerve away from the fascia iliaca and just come back and really dissect that nerve away from the fascia covering the iliopsoas. And you do that, just this is almost, you feel like an artist when you do that because now the nerve is gonna be floating in a puddle of local anesthetic. So before you put your needle down, you know that you're gonna have a very effective like you no know, block and you are becoming very, very consistent and very confident about the results of your nerve block. So that's 
how we do it with the ultrasound. And again, what comes after the femoral triangle is going to be the adductor canal. And let's see, like, you know, all the hype about the adductor canal. Um, as the femoral nerve just starts to branch out, it gives all the muscular branches that supply the different muscles. And also it does the, it gives the anterior femoral cutaneous that is gonna come out and supply the anterior part of the knee, especially the skin over the knee joint. And then it's gonna go down, right? A large part of it, like a major branch of it is gonna be lateral to the superficial femoral artery right here. And even more immediately, you're gonna see the saphenous vein. But this is all going to be covered by a big muscle. What is this muscle? This is the sartorius, exactly, right? And here it's highlighted. So what happened if we hide the sartorius? If we hide the sartorius, we're going to get this picture. We're going to have the sartorius, and underneath it, you're going to have the femoral artery, the superficial femoral artery, and lateral to it is the saphenous nerve. Let's see that under ultrasound. You're going to see here the sartorius, the femoral artery, the saphenous nerve. All right, great. So what is this? This is what we, the term that we're gonna use right now with a lot of reservation, we're gonna say this is the adductor canal block, but we're gonna, let's talk about that in a second. But for now, we can call it that, or we can call it a femoral triangle block, because really we're still in the femoral triangle. We're not in the, in the absolute 100% uh, adductor canal as described by the anatomist. But the idea that it is a sensory nerve and we're avoiding some of the motor supply to the quadriceps. So if you did that for a patient who's having a total knee arthroplasty, you can essentially provide some analgesia for that patient without compromising the motor function of the quadriceps, which is going to be translated, hopefully, to better physical therapy and better functional recovery for that patient after a procedure like um, total knee arthroplasty. It's also used for... ACL and ligament construction of the knee, and it can be used as a supplement to sciatic nerve block for foot procedures. All right. Um, again, we've seen that before, and just let's see how the block is done. You see, this is a sartorius, this is the artery, this is the saphenous nerve, and let's see how we do it. Then the needle is approaching, is going through the sartorius, right? And now we're going to start to inject the local anesthetic. And you're going to see the local anesthetic start to dissect, like you know, around the saphenous nerve, okay, as you see right here. And as we know, that these comes in different flavor. It can come as a single shot, or also it come, you can put a catheter, you can leave a catheter in that place. And most likely in this location, you're also um, going to block, like you know, a nerve that is immediately lateral to the saphenous nerve, still in the adductor canal, it's the nerve to vastus medialis. There is going to be a fascial membrane separating between the saphenous nerve and the nerve to vastus medialis, but this has become also some very important anatomical uh, relationship. So about maybe, if, I want to say like you know, 15 years ago, the description of the adductor canal block like you know, came on, and there was like you know, a lot of hype about it. And uh, the people starts to compare the adductor canal block versus femoral nerve block study after study. But essentially, to summarize the evidence, we just, in terms of the analgesia, there was one camp that we were saying the saphenous or the, the adductor canal block is equivalent or at least not inferior to the femoral nerve block. And this is like some of the evidence for that. Another camp, they're going to say, no, in terms of analgesia, actually, the femoral nerve block is better because it's more complete. And then a third came was asking, does it need to be complete, right, block? And what does that mean? Because every patient who goes now for something like a total knee arthroplasty, right, or uh, any other procedure, they will get a whole host of different medications in terms of their multimodal analgesia. So let's say just by number, this is just rough numbers. This is not like you know, anything... Uh, Science. Let's say the efficacy of the nerve block is 80%, and the efficacy of the adductor canal block is 60%. Now, is this 20% difference really justify the weakness that you're going to get with the quadriceps mu muscle when you do the femoral nerve block in a patient who's having total knee arthroplasty or not? Can I supplement this 20% with the rest of the multimodal agents that are going to use for analgesia 
and something like the total knee arthroplasty. So these are all questions that are being debated like you know, nowadays. And even like you know, where exactly we put the location of the block itself makes a difference. And where the muscular branches for the nerve to vastus medialis comes up, this is also important. I did like you know, this uh, research with one of my colleagues. She's actually a, uh, another uh, like, you know, colleague of mine. She graduated from Alexandria. And we did that here. Um, they dissected like you know, a lot of uh, cadavers. I think it was six cadavers, just looking for where the nerve to vastus medialis comes and just trying to guide like, you know, the clinicians about really the locations where to do a, the adductor cannot block to avoid the uh, muscular weakness. In terms of the functional recovery, again, like you know, there are um, some evidence to support that the adductor cannot block is better. And there are some evidence to say the adductor cannot block is equivalent. There is not much difference. And this was a study that we did, but this is now like you know, about five years old. And, uh, the one thing I want to tell, especially for our residents or our trainees, that when you're having a total knee arthroplasty, your quadriceps is going to weak no matter what. Imagine that the surgeon is actually, he or she is doing incision through the tendon of the quadriceps. That's number one. So even without you doing a block, the quadriceps is infected. The other thing to have to remember, the process of the degenerative arthritis in of itself is also going to affect the tendon of the quadriceps muscle. So this is something that we really have to think long and hard about it before blaming everything on our block and all the weakness and the affected muscle, the affected muscle weakness coming from the block. And we have gone like you know, through multiple iteration of the description of the exact location. So people term, tend to call like you know, that a triangle up top is the proximal femoral triangle. And this is just the distal femoral triangle. Um, this is in terms of whether you consider the medial border of the adductor longus as the, uh, sorry, the lateral border of the adductor longus as the, at the boundary or the medial border of the adductor longus as the boundary. But we know that at the apex of the femoral triangle, this is where the anatomical, the anatomical adductor canal block starts. You may say, you, you may say, like, you know, I'm not going to bother myself with that because, especially if you're doing a catheter, you really have to consider, like, you know, the incision and the surgical field, and your catheter has to be away, like, you know, from that uh, surgical field. Right now, we're going through an effort. That effort is led by Ezra and Ezra to really define, like, you know, our blocks and where we do our blocks and what do we call our blocks. So whether the, it's really the adductor clamp block is really an adductor clamp block or not. And I can just give, give you a sneak peek that is the recommendation is really to be calling it a femoral triangle block. And the adductor clamp block is any block that you do after the apex of the femoral triangle until you get to the adductor hiatus. Also in the literature, you're going to see like you know, different names, like the proximal adductor canal block, the distal adductor canal block, the subsectorial something, something. So, but just that's why that we're going through that effort to really try to standardize the names of the different blocks. We did that for the fascial plane block in the paper that came out last year, if you're following the regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. And this year, we are working on standardizing the nomenclature for both the upper and lower extremity nerve blocks. Falls is a big deal, especially in orthopedic surgery. And you don't want to be contributing to falls, but you cannot help it. If the quadriceps is weak and you did a femoral nerve block, and if the patient has orthopedic surgery, period, without you even doing any nerve block, about 1% to 2% of these patients are going to fall in the orthopedic world. Okay, but if I'm doing a femoral nerve block and I'm making the quadriceps weak, so maybe this patient is going to be maybe a little bit more likely, okay, to fall. Am I willing like, you know, to take on that risk or not? One of our friends from the Hospital of Special Surgery, Stavros Mantisudis, he looked at a big database and actually he found that falls after orthopedic surgery is not associated with the performance of nerve block. What we did on a different scale, about five years ago, we looked at the femoral nerve block and compared it with the adductor canal block. And we looked at something called the Tinetti scale. The Tinetti scale is used by a physical therapist and they measure the risk of falls. And each patient get a score based on their performance on that score. 
and we measure that scale both in the femoral nerve block and the adductor canal block. And actually, we found that there was no significant difference between the two. But in terms of the quadriceps muscle itself, the quadriceps muscle was more preserved when we did the adductor canal block versus the femoral nerve block. So what does that tell you? That tells you that falls is not only, only a function of the weak quadriceps. There is a lot of factors that's going to go into that. Because remember, this patient is coming from anesthesia. They're getting opioids. They may be dizzy. And even the blocks that you do, remember the blocks that you do is not only capturing the sensory and the motor. There's sensory, motor, and proprioception. Sometimes you are at risk of fall even if you did an upper extremity nerve block because your balance is off. So this is something that you really have to think about like you know, when you do these blocks. So if this is the... Um, uh, if this is the case, all right, um, what, uh, what, what else should we do? We should be essentially putting together a comprehensive program that has a collaboration between physical therapists, nurses, anesthesia, anesthesiologists, and surgeons to really come together with a comprehensive program to prevent like the falls on the floor after orthopedic procedures. Okay, so we talked about the femoral nerve as a big one. Now, for the sake of completion of the different um, nerves of the lumbar plexus, let's talk about the lateral femoral cutaneous. The clinical utility of it is not like, you know, as much, but probably for the sake of completion of the block, we know it's a pure sensory. It is just going to be between the sartorius muscle and the tensor fascia lata, and it's right here. Sometimes we do it if the patient is, if we're doing a harvest for as politicians can graft or something of that nature. Oh, so this is the, the tensor fascia lata and the one before that was a sartorius and the nerve is going to be sleeping between them. And this is how the nerve is going to look like on ultrasound. The obturator, again, it's one of the things that the clinical utility of the obturator nerve block in of itself is not going to be that much. There was a point in time, I would say, in the early 2000s that some investigators were investigating whether adding the obturator nerve block to a femoral nerve block would result in better analgesia after total knee arthroplasty. We know that it comes and supplies the medial part of the knee. Um, but right now, and if you really want, like, you know, some of the extraneous or some of the rare indication for obturator nerve, maybe you can do it as a supplement for spinal anesthesia if you're doing something like TRBT under spinal anesthesia. But again, something to think about. So this is the obturator, and again, we know that it divides into anterior branch and posterior branch, and these two branches sandwich the abductor brevis. Okay, okay, All right. This is the abductors of the hip. Okay, so this is gonna be the pectineus, and this is the longus, the brevis, and the magnus. The anterior branch is gonna be right here, and the posterior branch is gonna live right here, okay? All right, so that was about the lumbar plexus. So we took the lumbar plexus really all the way from very proximal. We talked about lumbar plexus, fascia iliac, femoral nerve block, and we covered very briefly the obturator and the lateral femoral cutaneous. So now half of the supply of the lower extremity done, finished, period, let's move. So now we're moving to the sacral plexus. So what's the other part? The sacral plexus supply mainly what's the back of the thigh. This is like you know, the other part. And again, we know it starts from L4 all the way to S3. And the big, big major branch is the sciatic nerve, right? There are other branches that also, of course, as important, the posterior femoral cutaneous, the superior gluteal, the pudendal, but again, the clinical utility of these nerve blocks, maybe just for chronic pain, it's like no more relevant more than the acute pain. Um, again, you probably have, you can tell by now that like, you know, anatomy of the areas that I'm really, really, like you know, interested in, so I want to, I'm gonna bother you with some, a little bit more anatomy. So you see like the sciatic nerve right here, as it comes, this is coming from the sciatic foramen. And as it comes from the sciatic foramen, there is like you no know, different approaches along that line. This is gonna be like you know, the parasacral approach and it starts to give the branch here, the posterior femoral cutaneous. Again, like you know, most likely the uh, the utility of like you know, some of the nerves that you see on the screen, 
the clinical utility of blocking them is going to be almost like no, no nothing, right? Um, and you the as it comes down posterior, you're going to see this is the gemelli, so this is the superior gemellus and the uh, anterior internus and the uh, inferior gemellus. And this muscle that looks like a square, this is going to be the quadratus femoris, right? And as the sciatic nerve, you see how big it is, right? And it's coming down. It's going to be really lying between the hamstrings, between the adductor magnus on um, one side, and it's going to have the biceps femoris on the other side. And it's going to come down, and as you see that it's going to give like a lot of muscular branches to the hamstrings as it's come down until it really comes down to that point. Right, and it's scars to divide right into two branches. Like, you no, know, it's going to be one lateral branch. This is going to be the common pronoun, and the medial branch right here is going to be the tibial. So, you have the tibial and you have the common pronoun, right? And it's going to go down and it's going to just give nerve supply to the foot. And we're going to see that when we talk about the ankle block. All right. So I hope like, you know, this like, you know, anatomy is beneficial, right? Because now we're gonna take that and we're gonna try to apply it to our visual anesthesia. So we know the sciatic, we talked already about it and we talked about the anatomical pores and you're gonna see the gluteus maximus. Once we try to hide the gluteus maximus, okay, you're gonna see the sciatic is gonna be underneath it right here. And even up top here, it's depicted as almost it's two nerves. It's two nerves in one big sheet, right? One of them is going to be lateral, and the other one is going to be medial. And uh, you go you go down, and you're going to have a common pronial and posterior tibial, and just you're going to have like you know that uh, going down like this. Okay. So uh, close to the tibia, like you know, about like seven centimeter uh, proximal, okay, to the popliteal fossa, you're going to divide into common pronial and posterior tibial. And uh, this is going to be the a very beneficial thing for any foot procedure when we do it, because the nerve supply for anything below the knee is going to mainly come from the sciatic nerve, except for the medial strip that's going to be supplied by the saphenous nerve. So for ankle fractures and for foot procedure, a lot of approaches has been described over the year. Um, Starting from like you know, very proximal, you have the parasacral approach, which again something that's probably not as popular now. You just you're gonna go down. You have the um, you have the labat approach, right? You have the subgluteal approach, right? You have the infragluteal or the mid thigh approach, but the most common one, or one of the most common one, is the infragluteal one that is inferior to the gluteal. Um, fold, right, where we see sometimes it's distal to the um, to the gluteus maximus, but you see the nerve, it's almost between the uh, two bones, between the ischial and the greater trochanter of the femur. And also you can access the sciatic nerve from anterior, so there is another approach that we described for the sciatic nerve and anterior approach. Until it comes down and in the popliteal fossa, and you can essentially see the two components of the sciatic nerve. You see the tibial nerve and you see the common pronial, and you see the separation, you see it under ultrasound. You can do it in different position, whether the patient is laying supine or they are laying lateral. You can just do it in any of these position. And here, this is just to show you, like you know, how the two components under ultrasound. So the, here they are separate, and as I go more proximal. Okay, they're gonna to come together. Okay, this is a sciatic. Okay, we're gonna go down, they're gonna separate. All right. As we go distal, we're gonna go back up and they're gonna come. All right. So this is around the knee. If we went down, we're gonna do the ankle block. And as we know, the ankle block has five nerves that we block, four of them is gonna be branches of the, of the femoral or the lumbar plexus, and one of them is gonna be a branch of the, uh, of the femoral, which is the saphenous. Okay, we've seen this slide before. We're always in the quest to look for what is more um, 
sensory. What is how uh, how low can we go really with our ultrasound and the anatomy knowledge that we have? So we know when we do the sciatic, it's very similar phenomenon to the to the femoral nerve. We're going to affect some of the muscles, and the patient is not going to be able to contribute in physical activity. So what should we do? How about if we block the very terminal branches of both the common peroneal and the posterior tibial as they go and supply the different areas, especially if we're talking about knee procedure, if we're talking about total knee arthroplasty or ACLs. So how does that work? These two nerves, as they come, they're going to give branches, and mainly the genicular branches, the posterior genicular branches, they're going to give that to supply the posterior capsule of the knee. So if I'm able to just put some local anesthetic in that area, maybe I'm going to cover that pain without the patient who was suffering from a lot of motor weakness. So some authors initially, they proposed the selective tibial nerve block. So that way that they preserve the common pronail and the patient is not going to have the foot drop after surgery and they can contribute actively to their physical therapy. But some other people say, no, we can do something better. Okay, let's just try to put the local anesthetic under the ultrasound between the capsule of the knee and the popliteal artery. And this is going to capture all these terminal branches. So this is called the IPAC block. And the IPAC stands for injection between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee, the CK. All right, so let's see how that worked. All right, this is like you know, the, the IPAC. It was described back in 2012. And this is the, when you inject the dye, this is essentially, you get something like that. And you see both the the uh, the common perineal and the tibial nerves are not stained like you know, in this uh, picture. So that means you can get the sensory analgesia without getting the muscle supply the to these muscles. Okay, different approaches, different techniques. Let's see, like you know, a couple of them. This is how I like to do it. Right? Um, you're gonna see the this is a cavitating probe. It's just on the medial side of the knee. This is the femur or the capsule of the knee. This is the popliteal artery. And the popliteal artery here, the capsule of the knee right here. And shortly, you're going to see us like you know, put in the needle coming from medially and just going straight perpendicular. We're going to drop the needle like you know, straight down. All right. And this is essentially, I, I like it through it that way because no matter how big the patient is i i feel like you know this it becomes like a lot easier and the other thing also just not going from lateral to medial can avoid the um, this is the needle coming down and i am behind the popliteal artery all right and you're going to see the local anesthetic is going to spread along the posterior capsule of the knee uh, other approaches okay you can do something like this okay and this is going to be the picture that you're going to get. You're going to see the popliteal artery. You're going to see the nerves, the common peroneal and the posterior tibial. And you're going to go between the popliteal artery and the femur. You're going to go in this area. So let's see how this is going to translate. Okay, it's going to translate something like this. All right, this is going to be the needle. And the needle is going to be common. This is the popliteal artery. And we're just going to inject between the artery and the capsule of the knee. Right? So this is, again, just another way to do things differently. Yep. And here we're injecting the local anesthetic. And when you do something, okay, just like my advice to you is to try to just it's very good to be up to date and just looking at all the evidence. But if you have the means to investigate that yourself and ask questions, do it. So this is exactly what we did. We did that study, like now it's like a couple of years ago. We this published in 2020. And we looked at the analgesic efficacy of adding the IPAC block to a multimodal analgesia protocol for primary total knee arthroplasty. And we actually found like you know it is it has a beneficial effect in terms of the analgesia for these patients. Uh, our primary endpoint was pain in the back of the knee six hours after surgery. So this was our primary endpoint. And we have a whole host of secondary endpoints that we're also collecting. And we also looked at the area under the curve in the first 24 hours for all the pain score that was collected. And that was significantly different in patients who got the IPAC versus the group that did not get the IPAC. All right.
very good. We're not the only ones who are doing that. There is also other groups who did this. And other groups are saying like, no, it may work, it may not work. So the evidence is kind of conflicting. So you just have to just do it for yourself and just see what's going on. And this is another meta-analysis. But the meta-analysis show overall like you no know, beneficial effect like you know, for the IPAC when it's compared to the no IPAC or shell blocks. Well, but this is not the whole story. The whole story when we talk about how low can we go, remember that the when we talked about the adductor cannot block or the femoral triangle block to be more anatomically correct, it does not cover the entire nerve supply of the knee when you compare it to something like the femoral nerve block. So what are we missing? Were we missing the some of the muscular branches? Because muscular branches also tend to give sensory analgesia for the knee. And we are also missing on the terminal geniculate nerves that's gonna come and supply the knee. So you're gonna see the nerve to uh, the nerves to vessus medialis and the saphenous. This is probably covered okay by uh, by the adductive by the femoral triangle block, but the some of the nerves, like you know, these nerves and the uh, the geniculate nerves are not going to be covered. So how is it going to work? Okay. And recently, actually, in the past couple of years, there have been some authors who uh, proposed doing the genuclear nerve blocks for uh, total knee arthroplasty. Um, folks, and Dr. Yasser and others who do chronic pain, they're probably very familiar with the genuclear nerve blocks as they do it. They can do it under x-ray or they can do it with the ultrasound. And they either can just do a test block with local anesthetic, or they can do a radio frequency ablation. But you see, the different genetic nerves can also like be blocked to that effect. We don't like to block the inferior lateral genetic nerve because it comes very close to the common perineal as it traps around the the head of the fibula, and usually it just it may give you the incidence of foot drop like you know, after surgery. But essentially, this is the different genetic branches okay that we can cover. And th this was published uh, last year by the group from Duke, Jeff Gatson and, and his colleagues. They published that and actually found that adding the genetic nerve blocks to multimodal MGZ protocol, including the IPAC, has been very beneficial to these patients. But then comes the question, like, well, really, how many blocks that you're going to do for a patient coming from the arthroplasty? All right, and what is practical versus what is feasible? So these are all questions that we have to think about. Uh, and in general, just we say, uh, when we talk about complication of blocks of the lower extremity, as we've seen with the lumbar plexus, when we talk about the complication of the lumbar plexus, I always tell our residents that the complication falls into two categories. Block-related complications, meaning that the complication happened when you were placing the block in the minute of placement of the block, the needle is somewhere that it's not supposed to be, whether this is in the upper extremity is gonna be pleura or the lower extremity is gonna be a vessel or some, or actually inside the nerve or complication that happened without technical problems related to the block. What does that mean? Let's say that you did a perfect block. You did a popliteal or you did a sciatic block for a tibial fracture and that patient complained later on or was diagnosed later on with a compartment syndrome. And we can debate that for hours and hours, what is the effect of nerve blocks on compartment syndrome. But let's say that there was delayed diagnosis and they start pointing fingers and uh, blaming the blocks for delaying the diagnosis of compartment syndrome. What's gonna be, would this be considered a complication of a block or not? The block did exactly what it was supposed to be. It just numbed up the sciatic nerve. It gave the patient analgesia. Now, the clinical context now resulted in that complication. You did a perfect femoral nerve block, perfect technique, and then the patient fell on the floor. Is that a complication of the block? Or this is essentially a complication related to the clinical context rather than the complication of the block technique itself? So this is just a good framework to think about the complication of blocks. Um, and along the lines of the complication related to the block itself, is the local anesthetic system toxicity, peripheral nerve injuries, and infectious complication, especially if you're putting catheters and catheter with complications as well. Um, and again, this is the different camp that we talked about. Uh,
And really, this is uh, all you know, what I have to say today about the blocks for the law extremity. So in this past hour, what we talked about, we talked about the nerve supply of the lower extremity. We talked about the lumbar plexus. We talked about the sacral plexus. We talked about the different uh, techniques and approaches for blocking the different nerves that comes from the lumbar and the sacral plexus. And we just hopefully give you also an idea or a clinical context to when to do these blocks. So I was, my hope was trying to link like, you know, the anatomy and the basic knowledge to your everyday clinical work. And with that, I hope, like, you know, that you learned something today and it was not too boring of a lecture. Dr. Rosafa and Dr. Yasser and the entire family of the Menofei Anesthesia Club, really, it's a pleasure, it's a delight. Thank you very much for having me. And just anytime, just you tell me and I'll be there. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Nabil, for... Uh... This presentation, I was um, like Very concentrated nice. enough until I get a uh, hand pain and I don't feel except when you finish. So <laughs> uh, uh, as a summary uh, for your presentation, you press in some point like an, uh, uh, it's a, a, a general anesthesia is a practical physiology and pharmacology. Uh, regional anesthesia is practical anatomy, anatomy, anatomy is in pharmacology. And this is a very important point. Um, also, uh, you must study the dermatomal supply for each place because sometimes you make a, a successful block and the, the surgeon working in other area and you see that block failure is not block failure. This is your anatomy information failure. And uh, you said you must put the uh, eye on the tip of the needle because um, uh, the tip of the needle is the source of uh, effect and uh, side effect and the problem all the time. Uh, and uh, you brace in um, blend E, B, and C, mini block can be done for the same uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, procedure and you must select what's suitable for uh, your experience and uh, suitable for the patient. And um, uh, you speak a little about the, you know, regional anesthesia as a part of big multimodal analgesia. When you speak about that, when you give a narcotics and this narcotic crisis now everywhere, and the mini patient come from OR addict, as the study said, three to five percent to come uh, drug seeker. And uh, I think the sooner with ultrasound, it will replace an uh, cystoscope. And uh, every physician, whatever anesthesia or medicine or ICU, put an uh, uh, ultrasound probe in his hand or bucket. Uh, uh, but uh, just uh, before to get for the question, I have a little question because this is my area of practice and I was interested. Uh, first thing, uh, we know that from a study now that many, many, uh, uh, uh, many structures have variation. What we study in the university from, uh, about anatomy is not right all the time. For example, in a study um, in, in, from Nairoz and his colleagues, they found that, for example, lateral catenary network of the size of variation about 42%. So uh, do you think that this variation of anatomy between one and one can lead for failure or not? It's, well, thank you for the question, for the answer. It, it definitely it can, right? But I think just we get like you know, one step closer and closer uh, when you use ultrasound because most of you're going to put your ultrasound, you're going to look for the anatomical structure that are related. And if you find it and you see it, you just go for it. So this in of itself is going to account for like you know, this variation. And sometimes yeah. like we don't see it. Uh, and honestly, I would tell you like you know, in some patients that you try and just, you don't see it. So you just like you put it in the quote unquote, the target area and you try to be a little bit generous with the volume and just like, you know, you hope that it uh, is going to get where it, you need the, you need the local anesthetic to get to. And uh, second question, just for me, um, uh, uh, you don't speak about if there's an running study and mini center using an electrospiny blind block as uh, one block fit all can be used for cervical, thoracic now, lumbar, sacral, even lower limb. And the, I use it, I found a very good result, even for chronic pain, my official pain, back pain, even in some difficult cases with fixation and blade and screw, I can't enter the spinal canal, it works. So uh, what's your experience about electrospinal limb block and lower limb block? Uh, I think it's the, uh, it's the new kid on the block, as they say. So it's, yeah. the, it's the youngest child, and it's still like, you know, a spoiled, like, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. block, if you would say. 
So, and yeah. I think the, the jury is still out. Like, you know, what do I mean by that? I think we need like you know, more evidence. You're correct. Uh, like, you know, most of the times when, when I use it, like, you know, it works, especially, honestly, if the, if the patient is in pain, just try yeah. like, you know, somebody in pain and just come put an ESP in them and they do. We do not have a full, and I emphasize a full understanding of how it exactly works. We think we know, we have like you know, a lot of theories on the mechanism, but we cannot say 100% like know how it works. So I think yes. until we get to that point that we cannot just meet the, the bold claim that it's one size fits all. Some mm -hmm. authors, as you know, just they, they use it for shoulder arthroplasty. Some authors yeah. use it for hip arthroplasty, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in theory, yes, okay, it works. But again, if you are just putting a local anesthetic around the dorsal remai, what happened to the ventral remai of some of these nerves, right? Like, you know, are we skipping like, you know, some of the basis of the anatomy? And this is an entire era of the fascial plane blocks. It looks yes. like now that we put, um, yeah, we, put the, uh, we put the car in front of the horse. Okay, so we describe the block first and then look for indication for the block. And this is exactly the story of the ESP. So we found out we stumbled across the ESP and then now we're trying to look for indication for the ESP. And you're gonna find like case report after case report after case report coming. It yeah. may make sense, but until we find a, a, a conclusive evidence to really find how it works, I think we're still gonna have that debate. Uh, my colleague uh, Hatim Yusuf asking, uh, can you put a catheter in fascia iliaca or fascia iliaca block? Just to make a block and to put a catheter? Uh, yes, another, yeah. But you just like, you know, but, uh, but, that but there is a qualifier for that, uh, for Hatim. So if you're doing that, like, you know, let's say that you're doing that for hip, right? For hip fracture, hip arthroplasty. Yeah. You have to be like, you know, very cognizant of the surgical field. Because if you put it, like, most likely you're going to be within the area that they prep and drape. So what we did in the past, if you really, really have to put a catheter, sometimes that you can put a catheter and tunnel it medially if you have to do that. Yeah. Another question from our uh, professor, Dr. Abdelazim Dawlatli, asking about liposome, the debate about it. Uh, uh, there is a conflicting report of its duration of action. Some reports say 72 hours, other states similar to BBVK recently, uh, and a theology robot showed no difference in its duration uh, than regular BBVK muscle comment. Well, I had from Nazim, and uh, you know, it, it, this is one of the things that is mind boggling for me that when you read like you know, some of the studies, just they say they swear by it, like you know, it works like you know, 72 hours. Is that mainly like you know, based on evidence, or this is mainly based on industry propaganda? I, I am not sure. You probably the study that he's referring to came the last couple of months in anesthesiology, it was comparing the liposome of Puvacaine versus just regular Marcaine with dexamethasone for shoulder arthroscopy. And actually they found like no, no difference whatsoever. I use it like, you know, sometimes in my own practice and the results, I'll tell you the, the very, very wide range of results. And this is, again, this is like our own experience. Sometimes you get like you no know, patient, it's even shorter than the regular plots. And sometimes it's, it actually, patients are very comfortable. So it's one of the things that really, I cannot really wrap my head around it. And I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a, a definitive answer, but it's really one of the things that it, it's, I have the same questions. I mean, yeah. For me, uh, just say uh, it worked with me for a long time, even for more than seven days. Yeah, I found yeah. a difference, but I don't make a study because really it is an expensive drug and they're replacing the catheter, but it worked, especially in facial brain block. It yeah. can work for surgical surgery. The patient don't take anything three days, four days until he take an oral medication. Most of well, the time. Well, uh, yes, but, this is your experience. Like you know, we you should you should uh, try to study that formally. We can. Yes, yes, it. I know, I know. But uh, there is a debate, you know, like this. But uh, uh, you know, uh, yes, okay. So uh, again, uh, question about uh, some um, uh, uh, asking about. Can you make a uh, uh, lower limb surgery with nerve block only without any uh, other method like general anesthesia or uh, general anesthesia and hip and knee surgery? Uh, so uh, the answer is it depends. <laughs> the answer is two things. Yeah. Yes, it depends, but of course, yes. Okay, let's say that it's an ankle fracture, right? 
an ankle fracture, for example, it's very, that's very easy that you can do a popliteal saphenous and the patient is going to be very comfortable with yes. some sedation. Okay, let's say that you are doing a, uh, like, you know, any foot procedure, you can do that. Let's do when you're doing below knee amputation, even if you're doing like you know, above knee amputation, that you can do spinal, you can do blocks. But again, yes. there is a lot of factors, like, you know, this, are these patients receiving anticoagulants or not? How big are these patients, honestly? Because I always, one of the questions that I ask my residents, and you can ask them like, you know, anytime, when they say just usually we ask about the heart, the lungs and everything. One of the questions that I ask, like, you know, almost the very first question, how big is that patient? Because I honestly feel like, you know, if they're not big, you can do anything with them. If their anatomy is good, you can do a lot of things with them. It opens like, you know, a whole host of options for you. Yeah. Uh, another question from uh, admin is that you're asking about uh, do you use injection pressure for I don't, uh, I don't. yeah yes uh, uh, also um, in patient unfit for uh, uh, general anesthesia can we use surgical lower limb by radio frequency ablation of lumbar plexus uh, so okay. I, will let, I will let you answer that question that you answered. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know that we don't, this is not a regular practice, but I found some uh, study uh, literature about uh, uh, femoral nerve pulse radio frequency versus, but it says a few number, versus local anesthesia. And really, he bring them some result, but not immediate post operative. They found that late post operative being more bitter with mm -hmm. radio frequency, but uh, still you, you can't answer this. You can't make it a li like a regular practice. As uh, Prof. Nabil said, it must have an evidence, you know, because yeah. sometimes have a mini case report, case series, but this is not an, don't bring an evidence. You need an RCT, uh, high scale, multicentric to be and have an evidence. So there is some study showing that, but there must just a case report and uh, this is not a normal practice. Uh, uh, which which a better approach for uh, uh, femoral injection? Uh, sorry, uh, fascia iliaca block, infrainguinal or supraingoinal? Uh, the answer also, like, you know, it depends, all right? Uh, most of it, if you talk about simplicity, just from the sake of simplicity, the infrainguinal is, is, is a lot simpler because everybody probably is very familiar with, like, you know, the femoral nerve block, with the anatomy of the femoral nerve block. You can scan lateral. You can either go in plane or out of plane. As you get like you know, more and more comfortable with ultrasound and you can do both, like you know, you're gonna find yourself like you know, just essentially improvising and just like you know, doing yeah. things on the fly. But if yeah. this is some, if you're picking the needle and the probe like you know, for the first time, I think probably an infrainguinal approach is better. If you have like you know, some experience with the ultrasound, I would just invite you to try the supraingual one. Another question from uh, our colleague is asking about your experience about uh, uh, hip surgery or, or neck femur fracture or whatever in, in the hip joint. And uh, what is the preferred block for you? For, uh, for hips, let's say like for hip fracture, I like to do fascia iliaca block. Uh, if I am doing the block with one of our residents, I just tend to do either the infra or the supraingulant approach. And ideally, if the patient is not an anticoagulant, I would do spinal anesthesia. This is my ideal approach, right? At least yeah. in my mind, in my clinical practice. Um, you're asking about TKA as well, total yes, myopathy. Yes. So yes. The, the protocol that we have is the patient get multimodal analgesia, starting from yes. the reoperative. They get, uh, we recommend, okay, spinal anesthesia for them. Okay, yes. and, and um, we, they get both like you no know, femoral, uh, they got uh, a ductal canal block and they get an eye pack. Yeah, this is kind of yeah. uh, No more questions, so the floor for uh, Dr. Yes, sir. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, I have uh, Dr. Yes, sir, Dr. Rasofo, excuse me. I have a comment and I have a question for uh, Professor Dr. Nabi. Hey, the you? comment actually it is a message for our residents that. Uh, uh, our job doesn't end at the end of surgery, but it, it, it extends beyond this uh, point uh, for how to control the pain, how to uh, uh, uh, get your patient uh, to ampulate as soon as possible, post-operatively, how to apply the ERAS protocol. 
Uh, uh, oh, this is a message this for. This was yes, my question with Sam. This was my question with Sam. This yeah, was my but... question. You, you transfer <laughs> the borders. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's not so far. But, no, uh, no, no. Um, so, yeah. but uh, my question for uh, Professor Dr. Nabil after this long time for practicing uh, regional anesthesia, uh, what, what is the incidence of? Uh, of nerve injury of direct or direct nerve uh, damage after regional anesthesia. Did you see any patient like that? Or uh, uh, what is the incidence? Uh, how can we um, avoid? Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you for question, Osen. Uh, uh, yes, you do see it. And the incidence, this is not like you know, my incidence. This is the incidence of what's written in the, in the ASRA guidelines. It's 0.2%. So you have about two in a... Uh, about 10,000 patients, right? And it depends. It's it, it really depends on like what's your definition of nerve injury. Are you talking about something in the immediate uh, period after surgery, or are you talking about the long-lasting surgery? So if we're talking well, about well, the, yeah. if we're talking about like the, um, the immediately after surgery, the, you know, the first couple two or three days, you can find that incidence up to 30 percent. 30 percent. I repeat, maholi tiltena ini mungkin masan tli masan andom tingling numbness yeah, for the, for the, for the 48 72 hours and then like you know that number yeah. it starts to decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease mm -hmm. and then you end up with probably two and ten thousand who's going to have permanent nerve injury it, i think it depends on the context you are working in a teaching institution i am working in a teaching institution you're working with residents this is first and foremost this is your responsibility sometimes i feel like you're know, having the ultrasound in the unexperienced hands, it's actually harmful more than useful. What do I mean by that? If you don't know what you are looking at and you are just essentially jabbing the needle, okay, you can actually be in dorm, doing more harm than being do more good than just using the nerve stimulation, right? So th there has to be like you know, some level of comfort and some level of expertise. Like uh, sometimes, like you know, some residents like you know, they don't like doing nerve blocks with me because I, I'm gonna be like you know, very particular and I'm gonna insist, like you know, that I see the tip of the needle. Like, you know, where's the tip of the needle? Show me that tip. Show me your target, right? So as long as like you know, you start to adhere to all the parameters, you do everything, and before everything, you inform the patient about that finite amount of risk that they are, uh, they may have. I think this is all you can do. You, you just you do your best honestly like you know this the, you can say the same thing about like difficult airway and not able to ventilate not able to intubate right you just you do like you know oh, probably oh. thousands thousands of airways and there's going to be one case that's going to humble you and humble you really like you know in a very uh, in a very good way so oh. you you just you, you do your, your best and you try to adhere almost and excuse my language try to be very anal like you know, about the steps and about really what you see and very stick to like steps one, two, three, very uh, programmatic and very systematic. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Nabil. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, a small comment about Dr. Hussam. Really, I am as a, bank, a chronic pain clinician, the story not finished after a few days after OR. But I have about 20% yeah. of my patient coming with persistent postoperative pain or what's called chronic postoperative pain. And this chronic. is a very difficult to treat. So not if it finished for you after a few days, it's not finished for me even after a few, few years. And I, I have a problem because the patient not use a multimodal analgesia, not use a bitter analgesia, mm -hmm. some genetic factor, some, uh, you know, surgical factor, many factors affecting that. And uh, thank you for... Uh, uh, speaking about that, because now we just have a preoperative interruption and delayed both yes. operative for coordinating yes, management. Yes. Thank you. We are, uh, we so, are continuous yes. ring, Dr. Yasserian. We are completing each other. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> a lot, sorry, I found a question here. Um, uh, does the, the, sorry, does a block for uh, decrease the incident of both operative delirium? Uh -huh. Uh, it depends on the context. Are you asking about every context or are you asking about the context? I'm assuming that you're asking about hip fractures. I'm assuming, yes. right? Yes. Especially yes. that like, you know, hip fracture, this is probably like, you know, the highest incidence of delirium, like, you know, after surgery. And uh, there are, again, there are some evidence to support and some evidence to refute that claim. 
Uh, I like yeah. to think as somebody who is really biased towards regional anesthesia, that it would decrease the incidence of post-operative delirium. It makes sense, yeah. right? Yeah. Now you're decreasing the delirium, at least uh, you're decreasing opioids and now you're decreasing the delirium. Yes. However, delirium is very multifactorial, okay? You yes. cannot just say like, no, I'm gonna do a block and it's gonna decrease the post-operative delirium. It's not gonna help at all. If you do a block, but you give that patient, for example, like a lot of benzos, right? You were very heavy handed like you know, with your anesthesia. The patient just, you didn't orient the patient and you just put them in very unfamiliar environment, right? So it has to be a more comprehensive uh, protocol like you know, around the patient. And one of these steps of the protocol is neuroclox. So I'm talking I, about, I know that yeah, it will take you of time, but still, yeah, yeah. If I, so, I have sorry. a comment, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Nabil, uh, as regard to the uh, post-operative uh, uh, post -operative cognitive dysfunction, especially in elderly patients with trauma, with multiple drug therapy, with uh, some sort of um, uh, behavioral changes or like that, in so elderly patients more than 70 years, uh, the question of my colleague, uh, I, I suppose that uh, if we had a regional technique the original technique itself, all the additives with the original technique will influence the uh, incidence of post-operative cognitive dysfunction uh, based upon your own experience. Yeah, you, when you're talking about additives, do you mean the additives to the block or do you mean additives like sedation and additives? Additive, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, please, I, I want to clarify this point. Uh, the, do you have, uh, the sedation in, in every local uh, anesthetic or in every local or regional techniques you do, you should give your patient a sedation or the, just the, uh, just the compliance, just the reassurance, you will proceed for uh, the, the regional technique without sedation. Yeah, you know, one of the greatest drugs we give for sedation, something called TLC, that's tender love and care. Okay. <laughs> this is called hand holding technique, all right? Uh, okay. especially if somebody's elderly and you really don't want to give them like you know, a lot of benzos. So I think this is like, this is use your judgment. Like, you know, that, that's, yeah. Use your judgment. Yes. That's my. Do, do you use benzodiazepine, for, for example, uh, midazolam or like that? If a patient is, is, is young and is robust and I don't think like, you know, they are at risk of something like this. Yes, I definitely use midazolam. And, but if they are at risk of like, you know, of all the stuff that you said, I am not gonna use it. Uh, for example, like, you know, I will tell you, I will give you a small example. I tell my patients, especially in patients who are young, who are young, I tell them- okay, like, does, the, does the dexamethamidine have a role with you as a sedative one? Uh, it, it can, all right? And again, it all depends on the context. I like to use dex a lot, especially in patients who are big and obese and have sleep apnea, all right? Okay. Okay. I, I like to use that better than propofol. All right, um, okay. but if, uh, yeah, if, if you have to use sedation, right? Yeah. We tend to underutilize like no propofol like to a great deal. I always tell our residents that 10 milligram of propofol is actually, it's short acting. It's not gonna have that long lasting effect. The patient is gonna okay. be like no sleepy and really just, but use it very judiciously. Just 10 milligrams of propofol. It, it, it, it is really like no great for sedation and it, it helps a lot, especially like in, in elderly patients. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. So, so the question is: the sedative or the additives to original technique will influence more the post uh, post operative cognitive dysfunction? Yes, it will. Uh, there is actually there was a study that was done. Okay, that was came out from Hopkins, and they put a bis monitor in patient who had spinal anesthesia for hip fracture, and actually they found like you no know, more than sixty to seventy percent of patients. All right. They spend about maybe 60 to 70% of the time during surgery under a state of general anesthesia as defined by the BIS monitor, right? So again, that's why that you have to know and define what is your sedation protocol. Like, you know, are you able to maintain meaningful communication with the patient while they are sedated or not, right? I think, the, the, yes, okay, it definitely influenced the incidence of POCD. I'm sorry, my, I'm sorry, my last point. I'm sorry, my last point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know so, that you are very tired. It's my last point. Uh, as regards the IPEC, please, Dr. Nabil, 
um, uh, do you have uh, some additives to prolong its action? And do you hope for it to be a forward step in EROS after knee surgery? Uh, so the, the, to the first question, uh, not all the time, okay, but if you want to add something, I would add dexamethasone, okay, to the local anesthetic. I honestly, I would give the dexamethasone systemic, okay, especially in patients who are having knee arthroplasty. It's going to help, like, you know, hopefully in prolonging the duration of local anesthetic and also going to help with pain and it's going to help with uh, prolong the prevention of postoperative nausea and vomiting. And yes, okay, I hope it is one step forward in in something like ERAS protocol for knee arthroplasty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Uh, there is a last question before we leave. I know that you are tired and thank you for your time. Uh, our one of our colleague asking about medical legal point. Uh, he went just to make an anesthesia, regional anesthesia for a patient comfort trauma, and they may have a nerve injury. Uh, what's your opinion about that? I Most of us avoid avoiding to make a regional in some cases like this. I think like, you know, the, the, the way around that is really very, very, very clear communication between the anesthesiologist and the surgical team, all right? Just like, you know, go to them, ask, like, you know, what is the location of this? Do you guys have any suspicion of any nerve injury? A lot of times, like when you communicate with them, for example, it's a fracture humerus. They said like, you know, it's very close to the spiral groove and the radial nerve, like, you know, may be injured. Really, can you delay the block until after surgery? Said, sure. Like, you know, we can do the block in the PACU. So in the PACU, they finish the surgery. They just make sure that the radial is intact, okay, with whatever tests that they want to make after the patient is awake up. He or she is still in a lot of pain. We do our block. But at that point, at least, like, you know, they have already tested that block, right? They have tested the, the, the nerve injury, and they know that there is no nerve injury. Um, sometimes, like, you know, the patient comes, believe it or not, they say, you know what, like, you know, this, the bone is actually in two fragments, and the radial is already out, right yeah. the radial with the sector and we know that okay if you want to do a block like go ahead right so i think like clear communication is key clear communication is key to that um, i think i'm just i'm answering from um, the country here or the arabic country is totally different from america because the close claim about nerve injury if it's not going for investigation it come in justice what's the reason behind that and mostly the surgical related but here in Gulf area and in Egypt. It's an anesthesia related, whatever happened. So uh, I, I have a vision, I have a surgeon here. He never liked a block. And one day asked me to make a block for a patient. You know? And I'm just joking with him. I tell him, are you, are you sick or you have COVID or you, because you're asking me for block and never asking me for block. I'm just going to make a block and asking the patient to have some numbers. And there's a, his, his assistant, his, my friend, tell me don't to make the block because he want to incriminate you about the nerve injury because he's a very bad surgeon. I will make a nerve injury. So I think in America, you have this option just so because there is a real justice and the people investigated in neutral way, in clear way, but in our country here, uh, just to keep calm and they incriminate anesthesia all the time. And yeah. whatever yeah. happened, this is a problem here. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, you know, anesthesia is blamed everywhere, like you know, in America, <laughs> everywhere else, right? But what you're describing, this is a really, really, really bad situation that I really I don't yeah. you for you for. Yeah. Even in so USA, you are blamed, Dr. Nabil. Even in USA, anesthesiologists oh, uh, everywhere, Dr. Oh. Safa. It's all those anesthesiologists. Okay. Anesthesia's fault. okay. Yeah. Um, so the floor so for you, Dr. Uh, Safa, and thank you very much, Dr. Nabil, for your time. Okay. Yes, it's so great. Happy. Thank you again, thank you very much for life for thank you. I'm very happy to be with you today. So very... so happy, so happy, and proud, and appreciate your effort, Dr. Nabil, and the kind response. Uh, we hope to meet you. More and more again. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Elegant and fascinating lecture. Exactly. And, and could be a reference. Could be a reference for us. Thank you. Thank you.